Welcome back, everyone, to another one-on-one -on -one with Jerry Hall. It's always a joyous day in Casa de Jerry when I get a scheduled conversation with a mentor and quickly becoming a friend, Mr. Raul Pell. Today's conversation is going to span the last four years. We're going to talk about the 2018 piece he did on the retirement crisis. We're going to talk about the 2019 piece that he did on Real Vision about the unfunded pensions. We're going to transition into the, two the 2019 piece that he did, the Bitcoin life raft, and conclude with his 2020 piece, The Exponential Age. I have questions for him from each one of those videos. He answers them eloquently, and then we get a chance to rift and kind of just have an open dialogue. Raul has been one of the voices in the digital asset space that's been, I would say, mature. He's non-tribal. He's bringing a macro financial background to this new space and looking at it through that framework. He sees the potential and he explains and justifies his reasons for why he's done what he's done and why he continues to do the things that he does. Raul needs no introduction from me. However, this video did. So anyway, enjoy the conversation. Please leave your comments because in this particular one-on-one, -on -one, we will be giving away one Real Vision Essential Tier subscription to a commenter. So I asked Raul off camera to give me a number between one and 100. Leave a comment. If you're that number, I will reach out to you and we will set you up with a Real Vision subscription to the Essential Tier. All right, folks, enjoy. Strap it in because that conversation is coming at you right now. So Raul, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me today. How are you? Good and always happy to sit down and chat with you. We always have a really good conversation. So we it's always do. fun. So before I get into the meat and potatoes, I've got to ask about the two beautiful women in your life. How is your mom and how is your you know, incredible wife? Uh, wife is good. It's her birthday today. So it's her birthday. My mom has gone back to Spain, replaced by my wife's mom who's arrived for a couple of months. So we're switching mothers right now, but I'm not switching wives. <laughs> that a kid. I was thinking about your wife the other day when I read an article about keto, you know, a nutritional keto program and autism. And the, and the studies and the links that they were showing around how nutrition can really, you know, like a keto balanced keto diet could really help autism kids with autism. And I know your wife is, that's something she's very passionate about. And I was curious, is that ever bantered around the dinner table when you're talking about what's going on in her life? No, because she keeps trying keto and then gives up on it. So she, um, <laughs> she, um, she is a behavioral analyst. So it's about trying to give uh, kids with autism early on the tools to communicate and understand the kind of rules that they need to operate within because they, they they struggle with those kind of things. So she spends a lot of time doing that. But I think there's a whole, and she's now actually uh, doing a PhD in psychology to get a different variation on this. Yeah, she's a slight overachiever um, to get a different version of understanding. And I think that, you know, diet and other stuff is another important thing. So I'll keep hounding her about it. Right on. Well, that is so, I'm glad I'm, when, when, when the family unit's good, generally everything works itself out, right? Yeah. And that's exactly wonderful. Right. So one of, what I wanted to dive in with you today, I want to take a trip down memory lane. Part of one of the most influential elements of my financial literacy journey has been real vision. And I stumbled across it, like I think a lot of people do, on the free YouTube channel. Now, there are four seminal pieces you did one in 2008 called the coming retirement crisis. And I have a question I want to ask on that. The 2019, how unfunded pensions will destroy retirement. 2020, the Bitcoin life raft. And of course, 2021, introduction to the exponential age. And so I wanted to start with this question from 2018's piece, the coming retirement crisis. 
you showed a graph about the demographics, right? The baby boomers and this year over year increase. So in 2018, 3.8 8 million baby boomers were going to retire in 2018. And it showed each year the number increasing, increasing, increasing all the way to 2027, where it was estimated about 4.3 million baby boomers will be retiring. My question is, what does that mean for the economy? All these people reducing their spending and having to liquidate assets. So interesting enough, over the pandemic, that trend accelerated because a lot of people were hanging on and staying in the labor force, right? Because they didn't have enough money to retire. Pandemic came along and a lot of people just left the labor force. <laughs> so what does it mean? So there's a lot of talk of inflation and growth, and but the trend rate of growth is likely to be going down because, and we won't know for a year or two until the stimulus comes out and, we, and the economy settles, but the reality is, is the highest earners have now stopped earning and they've left the labor force. So now left with their savings, a lot of them will switch to bonds. And so they've got their final amount of money or they become more risk averse because God forbid, God forbid you get a 50% market crash and lose half your wealth on retirement. So therefore, what's weird is also people are living longer. Well, actually not in America, bizarrely enough, but everywhere else in the world, people are living longer. So they're trying to calculate this pool of money. Is it enough? So I'm seeing my mother going through this calculation right now. She's 78 years old and she doesn't know if it's going to be enough. Now, luckily I can backstop her, um, but others don't know that equation. And the fear is imagine being 80 and running out of money and living for another seven years. That's the terror of imagine if I become destitute. So what it creates is a behavior that people tend to spend a lot less than they would have done. So I think that the baby boomers en masse will spend less than they would have done. Um, so we'll wait and see how it plays out, but that's my best guess. Well, one I've of seen the... it in real time with my parents, as you and I sure. have talked about in the past. Sure. Well, the thing that comes to my mind, and, and this will kind of put a bow on that 2018 um, piece that you did, I would hope everybody goes and sees, with a slower pace of growth, doesn't that have an adverse effect on the tax base? Therefore, governments around the world are going to have to try to figure out how to create something for that shortfall that they can't, they have no longer have access to. Yes. And not only that, but when you look at the labor force participation rate, which is basically the same thing, and it's all in that video, and I showed in that video too, that the Fed balance sheet follows it. And I can project forward because it's demographics, the labor force participation rate, and it shows that the Fed balance sheet keeps going because they're trying to fill the growth gap as these people come out of the economy because you've got this big problem of debt, not enough growth to service that debt equals Federal Reserve plus taxes. It's a complicated soup that just generally means, and we've seen it in Japan, that trend rate of growth is lower than we ever imagined. Wow. Let's jump to the 2019 piece you did, um, how unfunded pensions right could destroy retirement. One of the things you talked about, and it wasn't specifically in that piece, but it pertains to that piece, and that was coming up with a dialogue, speaking the language of, of the folks that manage pensions, coming up with a language that pitches Bitcoin as a solution. And I'm curious, has any of those processes come about? Like, I remember you actually putting out a, it might have been a daily briefing, it might have been something where you were saying, hey, anybody that works in that pension, if you work for the state of California pension or you work for this, Come talk to us because we want to learn how to model this asset into your language so that you understand so, it. Has that materialized so by any we chance? We did that. And I said, we need to speak the language of Barra, which is a portfolio asset allocation tool. So oddly enough, a Real Vision member said, oh, by the way, I used to work for Barra. And then I worked for the other competitor to Barra. And this is what I do. I said, could you write us the white paper? And they did. And he did. 
and then we shared it with as many people as possible. It got it kind of got lost in the noise. I can't remember what happened the day it came out, but some there was some other big noise that came out that that kind of meant it didn't make the impact that it should have done. But um, yes, we did that, and the community's there. But subsequent to that, I've spent a lot of time speaking to asset allocators, corporate pension plans, um, fund managers of all types, and uh, RAAs, registered investment advisors, about this. So it is on their radar screen. They're just slow to move. Now, that piece I kind of said to individuals, you can do this too. And you know, you were one of the people who did that. You just retired and you thought, well, okay, do I have enough savings to live off for the rest of my life? Probably not. What do I do? Thanks. And I said, listen, this might be the answer. Um, and I think hopefully some people have started to realize now that it is an answer and it's a very meaningful answer. And it, it not only is it is it an asset class with hope, it's an asset class with upside, big upside, potential upside, 100x from here. So it doesn't really matter how early or late you are. And it fits into traditional portfolio asset allocation models. That means it's not a stupid investment for those pension plans and others. So I think it just over time, if we look at the adoption of the Bitcoin network and crypto network overall, the internet was growing at 63% a year um, from 1990 to 2000. Right. Right now, and that in 1997, the internet had 140 million users, which is exactly where we are with crypto right now. Crypto is currently growing at 113%. So the internet was the fastest adoption of any technology in all recorded human history. Right. Crypto is twice the speed of adoption of the fastest ever recorded technology in all human history. We get to a billion people by 2024. That's exponentiality, my friend. We can't get our heads around. How does 140 equal that? But that's what it does. Oh, it, it, it excellent. So if one were to extrapolate what you're saying, we could literally be seeing every facet on the planet in this asset space in one way or another in the next three years, pension plans, even the most conservative insurance entities, even the most stringent conservative endowment funds saying there's some there there. I think whether that's the, I think by three years we'll have broken the back of it, meaning okay. the tide will have moved. Now we've seen the early adopters, you know, that's clear. We're all celebrating those victories, but then it's just going to become regular that we hear this. So we'll have broken the back of the momentum and by about five years, five, six years, you know, it'll be expected and you'll have to be answering to your trustees or your board why you've not used crypto. So that, that whole narrative will change because the regulators will have approved it. The central bank digital currencies will be in place. Uh, crypto as an asset class will probably be worth 20 trillion or 30 trillion, whatever the number is, right? Then you've got no answer. The regulators have said, yes, here's your restrictions and how you can use it. And therefore, people have to. So I've always said it's like being short a call option. I.e., the more it goes up, the more you have to buy it. I like it. I like it. Let's let's jump down to the Bitcoin life raft. Really like that piece, by the way. One of the things you stated, and and this is this is because I've learned enough now that I I've learned enough to know that I need to learn a lot more. Right. So maybe I've learned enough to be dangerous. But here's my thing. You stated in that particular piece, the Bitcoin life raft in uh, 2020, you stated that Bitcoin is a pristine collateral. And I agree with you. But here is my question, because I'm having a hard time reconciling the mechanisms. How does a collateral that has a wildly changing second to second price become an actual collateral in debt markets, really? So first, when you've got a collateral that moves a lot in value, it means you can lend less against it. It's as simple as that. Oh, so it's just a skew. It's, so it's basically a ratio game. So the, more, the lower volatility Bitcoin has over time as it gets more adopted, the more leverage there'll be against it. So right now, you know, you hear these terms like things are over collateralized. It's because Bitcoin's very volatile. You know, it's just been down 50% and gone back up another 30%. You know, 
and we all kind of understand that of the space now. But so therefore, as a lender, well, you know, if you'd have lent double on that, you'd have been wiped out. <laughs> um, so it, it depends what kind of lender you are. Now, they get around it in this 100x or 25x and all of this extra by having all, automatic liquidations and stuff like that. So that's different. But really, for it to be the pristine collateral that it is, volatility, the more the volatility comes down over time, as it gets more adopted, the more it can be used as collateral and the more value as collateral it has. And what is valuable collateral? Collateral, valuable collateral is collateral you can borrow against. You no, I, I get it. I got all that. Collateral. It was it was that valuation change, the volatility. But now that I look at it through a lens of it's just a ratio game, then it doesn't matter if it's the 10 year bond or a Bitcoin. It's the same fundamental floor. All the mechanisms will be the same. It'll only be the ratio that is. So let's well, the, say, for example, the 10 year, let's say 10 year bonds are. 5% volatility for easy maths and Bitcoin's right. 50%. It's not quite that, but roughly, right? That means with um, $1 of 10-year bonds, you can borrow 10 times against it. 10 times what you could in Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin's 10 times more volatile. I like it. I like it. And as it's like you were saying, as it's volatility begins to go down as the saturation or more more dollars come into the market and kind of rough out those volatility edges. Now I can see it expanding, right? Yes. So, and what makes it pristine is that you can't mess around with it, right? You, you can't make you more of it. Collateral. Exactly. You can't print more of it. Right. US bonds in a recession, <laughs> you actually get penalized for your collateral. Yeah. Because I've got US bonds, they're my best collateral. I give them to you because you want to borrow them. And what happens is the Federal Reserve makes a load more of them. And the price goes up, sure, because we're in the middle of a recession and you need the bonds. But my future gains have gone because yields have collapsed. So I'm like, okay, well, what was the point of owning that collateral in the end? Because I'm not getting any increased yield because the Federal Reserve dropped yields to zero. Now, with Bitcoin, it's probably going to work the opposite, because if you want my Bitcoin, you're going to have to pay me for it, because nobody can change the rate of interest on it um, in a recession by making more of it. There could actually be a return to, I'll use this word generally, savings. Yes, correct. My grandmother uh, lived a very wonderful life all the way to 103 years old on the back of bonds. Yes. She had no appetite for risk. And she lived great on her coupons. Yep. Wow. Exactly. And we can go back to that world in, in crypto. We're seeing it with DeFi and we'll see it with Bitcoin over time that, you know, you can choose your risk much like you can in credit markets. I can take a junk bond and get more yield or I can get US Treasury and get less yield. It'll be the same. It'll be Bitcoin will give you the lowest yield and and um, some of the junkier stuff, the more speculative assets will give you higher yields. And then what happens is there'll be periods of times in a crisis where nobody wants to have that collateral, which is the, the more speculative stuff. And people want Bitcoin and Bitcoin's yield will probably rise in a recession, which is the opposite of what happens now. Wow. I'm looking forward to those days, my friend, because I'll be, you know, the, the truth of it is, I believe most people are relatively risk averse with their future. Yes. That is a huge addressable market. <laughs> Big. All right, right on. I want to I want to now let's touch on the 2021 piece you did the introduction to the exponential age. This concept and I and I understood this early on of Medcalf's law but hear me out I had to actually write this question down if used as described I only need to watch the new users join the network to extrapolate value for Metcalf's law I want to ask you how does that change how does this change your thinking of it when the denominator is not people but instead the 
dollars that they bring to the network? The answer is, is I don't know. Okay. So, but the, the truthful answer is, it's not just the number of users. It's, there's another thing, is how many connections between the users. So Doge has a number of users, a big number, but there's not many use cases for those users yet. Yes, you can spend it at Dallas Mavs games and maybe Elon will do something and maybe he'll build a use case for it, in which case the network will have value. Right now, it just has speculative value, and that's okay. Um, Ethereum has enormous value because it's growing faster than anything else. It has an enormous number of users. There's all of the applications being built on it and all the developers. So it's like the perfect Metcalfe's law model right now is the Ethereum. So Ethereum is the sweet spot. There'll be other protocols that are less big, less well-known earlier in that cycle, and we don't know where they're going to get to, but we can assume we can extrapolate. So that's how I think of it. Don't think of the dollars. Don't think of the investments. Hmm. It's the head check is, A, do a lot of people invest in it? You know, do they want to be part of the network? And can they do stuff on that network? Bitcoin is building out its use case to deepen it, you know, above store of value. The Lightning Network is one of the key things. And, you know, they're trying to develop more spot, smart contracts and stuff. Does that take off? We don't know because it has its own perfect use case anyway. But, you know, we'll see this with, you know, whether it's in XRP or whether it's in Polkadot or whether it's in a bunch of these, Cardano, we don't know yet. Some of them are early, some of them are later. I mean, XRP is later and has more adoption, but people aren't yet convinced of the adoption. So that's okay, but we know what to track. So we can be kind of agnostic and have a, a way of valuing this stuff that we don't have to be tribal about it and praying for our network to win. We can actually say, look, my job here is to make money and what I want to do, I can have the philosophical thing about crypto and everything else, but if I, I want to make some money, I'm looking at this basic set of metrics. And then I can stop listening to all the noise because it drives you mad, as you know. It's hard. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've been fortunate that my I've never really been a maximalist about anything. I mean, when I first came to the space, the narrative around XRP was extremely attractive to me. I had some real world exposure to the value that it would bring if I had had it back then. And so it just made sense. But as I've gone deeper and deeper into the space and understood that I really don't know what the future is going to bring, anything could, like if you would have told me in 1995 that there'll be something built on the internet that I'll press and a stranger will show up and take me anywhere I want, I'd say, my mom told me never get in a car with stranger. Right. <clears throat> I would never have foreseen that coming yet. I use Uber almost every day down here. So the world changes, things changes. I don't know what's going to be built, but I think the answer for me, I built my portfolio around a foundation of smart contract platforms, because I believe that will be where an app is built that reaches billions of people will be on one of these Cardanos or Ethereums or polka dots or Algorands or whoever. So I've got a nice basket of all those things and I'm perfectly happy just sitting back and letting those, letting all that mass of human capital that's come into the space go to work and the, the finance guys like you come in and say, hey, there's, there's alpha here. Let's bring on our alpha hats, throw in some capital and get some alpha, right? So totally happy. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's the approach I have. I mean, I have a basket because I don't know. Yes, I know Ethereum and I've got a bigger weight to it, but other stuff I don't know. And I'm intellectually honest with myself that I don't know, but I'm quite interested in all of these protocols. And let's let the magic of the markets play out because most of them aren't going to go to zero, but maybe some of them dramatically underperform but there's going to be a bunch of these that are going to really, really, really outperform. And it will easily outweigh the ones that have underperformed. I could not agree more. So that was those four videos that we just, I got to ask you a question about each one leads me to this. You did this incredible hour conversation with this young lady from the Defiant podcast. And your rift on the second gen third gen type of nft stuff where we're talking about networks and communities 
and tokenization happened to coincide with a day that I read the article from a publication in from England about the Amazon insider that was talking about Amazon, talking about Bitcoin payments. But underneath it, it talked about Amazon also making its own community token. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God. And then I saw that podcast and you talked about the Disney, right? A company like Disney tokenizing their community across all their platforms. And I thought to myself, this, this is going to be ubiquitous. So now, now my whole smart contract platform thesis just gained tremendous value in my mind because now it's not just about what businesses are going to be built on these protocols. It's what communities are going to live there, interact with their news, interact with their, their like-minded people in ways that I think only Facebook and Instagram and Twitter have only scratched the surface of. Well, can you so rift on that? Because you, so you check, eloquently described this. Check me. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in this, but let me just <laughs> step back. So Amazon talk about a token. Mm -hmm. People are like this when it comes to Facebook DM. They don't understand. Facebook DM is a stable coin that they're trying to launch. And they'll launch first in the US because that's where they're going to get reg regulated. But then they're going to eventually launch globally. That's three and a half billion people with access to US dollars in the stable coin. But they own the rails. They're not offering it on Ethereum. So that makes it a social token too. This is Facebook's money. Just happens to be pegged to the dollar. Will it be in the future? We don't know. Maybe they introduce a separate currency. So you're about to think that China's got 1.3 billion people and got their own currency. India's got 1.3 billion, got their own currency. Europe's got, what, 350 million. Facebook, 3.5 billion, their own currency. That's more powerful than a nation state. And look at Jack Dorsey. What is he telling you about Twitter? He wants to use Bitcoin as a network of money on Twitter. So they are all moving this way. So what, what is it that they've seen? They've seen that the internet created a different world. The world that you and I grew up with was a world of the community that we grew up in as kids. And then it was the community of school. And then it was, this, if you went to university, it was your university or your work community. And then the community that you introduced, but they were physical communities. And the further you left home, the more you lost contact, then Facebook happened. And suddenly, all of the people that you lost contact with came back into your community. So now your community is not physical, but digital. But it changed that too. Like you and I, we can now discover global communities that have nothing to do with our physical location. I'm in the Cayman Islands, you're in Costa Rica, and we're both part of Financial Twitter, which is our community. And we're both active members of that community. But you and I both have communities in our own right. You have the Jerry Hall community and I have the Raoul Powell community. I have the Real Vision community too. So we have communities and they don't always overlap. But many of them do. So the world has moved to communities. So businesses like Netflix, you've got to worry about because they have a one-way relationship with their audience. They broadcast something, the audience pays them and consumes it. It's that. That's it. Jerry Hall's relationship with his audience is entirely different. We're broadcasting a video now. We've got live questions. You interact with them on Twitter. You have other things that you do with them. I do the same. Right? We have real communities. And whatever size they are, they're valuable to the community members and to us. And our job is to add value to that community. Our job is not to try and make money. Our job is to try and add value to the community. Money, knowledge, all of those things, great connections come out of that. So I think the entire world's business model is about to pivot to this. Why? Outside of the things I've told you, there's a little secret to humans. Humans create, as humans grow, there's, it's in Jared Diamond's book, um, 
um, Guns, Germs and Steel, which is, if people haven't read it, it's an astonishingly good book, but there's a lot in it to get your head around. But in there, he talks about the rise of human societies. And human societies, once you get over a certain size, you need to organise them. So you either organise them through violence, which is an autocratic way, or generally speaking, when societies become big, if you have to organize them by violence, you need a very big standing police force or army, and it's very expensive. So what you do is you have a leader, a mission, set of rules, and a reward system. So that's religion, and that's every country. So in religion, well, you know what the leader is. It's either going to be you know, the, the archbishop or the pope and the mythical leader, which would be the, the religious figure, the God or the Christ figure. And that will happen across all religions. Then they all have this mission statement, you know, what they, they kind of stand for. And so in Christianity, it's 10 commandments. And if you break them, well, there's your value system. You go to heaven or hell. Um, they also interacted, the Catholic church particularly brought in a system of money, which is you would pay money when you went to church that created a network effect of all of these churches collecting small fractions of money, which created enormous wealth in the Catholic church and different religions have different versions of that. But that's the same at country level in taxation, set of rules, which is the legal system, set of leaders, uh, mission, you know, it's quite funny that, and that's how humans control complex adaptive societies. Now, the part that is interesting to us for this conversation is that value system. Yeah. Because the value system in most society is money. So in the US, it's money. Costa Rica is money. Religion is not. It's, it's, a, it's another trade-off. Can be money part of. But in these communities, we can create our own money. And we can create our own leader. And we can create our own set of rules and our mission. So now we've created a fully functioning society. And societies either thrive or collapse if you look after the society well enough. It's like playing a game now. What was that game where, was it Second Life? Or whatever it is, you have to build a, your own, you know, civilization. Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's what Sims. we've been given. Sims, that's right. So we've been given the power of Sims which is to build our own civilizations. And that is what community tokens are all about. And what it means is that communities have a value above and beyond the equity of a business. Because it's like future potential revenue and opportunity, whatever that may be. It could be an introduction, it could be a learning, it could be money, it could be whatever. It could be you can sell NFTs, what, what the hell, who, who, who knows? So that's like the future potential value of that community. And that's what everybody gains in value. And it's above the value. So with Disney, it would be maybe hundreds of billions of dollars of value that are not part of the equity value of Disney. So that's like, oh my God, Disney as a nation, as a nation state in the digital world. So it's, it's, you know, it's a really, really fascinating development. And I think culture as an investment because musicians, you know, even what you and I do, it's actually cultural because, you know, we've got a cultural movement going on of learning about both finance and um, digital assets. And so it, you, you can invest in culture. So the Jerry token, whenever that comes out, people are investing in your culture built around your community. So that becomes amazing because you can invest in pop stars and things that really interest you, your, your favorite football club, soccer club, you know, these things that have mega fandom. And you can benefit from being a fan in ways that you couldn't do before. So if you then think this through and just have a few sleepless nights, you realize how ridiculously big this is. It's, it's mind-blowingly big because it's a change of all global business models. And listen, once people figure out what Facebook are doing or Twitter do, does, well, it's not long before YouTube is tokenized. Right. It's not long before Disney's tokenized. It's not long before any of them are tokenized. Because once one goes, they'll all go. Because tokens allow you to create aligned incentives with your customers.
I totally get that. Now, one of the things that I've heard you talk about and I found really interesting was you talked about specifically real vision in something you're interested in launching a token for real vision, but not sure how that relates to the business. One of the things I wanted to ask you, isn't there already existing models to look at, for instance, airlines with their airline miles? That brings a value to the company. And, and isn't that like if, a, if Delta bought American Airlines, wouldn't they in turn need to like honor all those airline miles? Isn't that part of the so. evaluation of the company? Well, wouldn't that, wouldn't that, wouldn't that apply to tokens if Real Vision created a Real Vision token? Would that, that increase the value Real... of our? Yeah. Would that increase the value of our equity? I don't know because it's not really been done properly. Probably, but they may be different rights. We might end up setting up a DAO. Ah. So that, you know, we don't know where this is really going, Jerry. We can guess. Um, if it just flowed into Real Vision that our treasury owns some, then it has a value but maybe it should trade at a premium to the treasury because the value of that community is future income. But maybe that's all in the down. I, I don't know. And it just makes me nervous, but we'll still do something. Have I lost you? Oh, I'm, well, I, I'm, I've been here the whole time and I heard everything you said. I, can, I'm, I, just, have, huh. I just drifted off in fantasy world for a minute sit thinking that I was at the table with you and your board and your top execs talking about this. And I'm excited because- Well, they, you know, it's difficult because, it's difficult because most people aren't at the same level of acceptance as me. So, okay, so I pull the trigger and say, right, look, let's do this. We get broad approval. I can waft my hands around and say, we'll just start a token economy. I can know, I can pretty much guess all of the key things that I need to do to drive the value to the tokens because we're a subscription business. It's pretty straightforward. You know, you start posting things on the exchange and people engage, you get tokens. You upgrade a product, you get tokens. You renew, you get tokens, right? You do good things for the community, you get tokens. Great. How do we capture all of that? What wallet do I use? How do I put that on the technology of the platform that every time Jerry does something, it earns a token? I don't know. And then I have to go to the tech team and say, can you figure this out? They're like, yeah, but we've got these 16 other things to do. I understand. It's this. It's that element of how do you do it? And, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm figuring that out. I'm having a lot of conversations with people to figure out how to, I know how the, I can drive value. I know that it doesn't matter that this, I don't want this token to trade on on you know finance or anything i want it to be a relatively closed loop at first because i don't want to make it about the money i wanted to make it about the utility value for everybody in the community that you want to go away and say guys you should come up to real vision because this bloody token has changed my life look what i've got you know i did this and this and this and then i've had a two-hour conversation with jim bianco about DeFi because of my token you know or whatever it may be that's real value so that i, I will get there um the, the actual fear i've got is now about how the hell do I actually integrate it into the technology that it automatically captures everything that Jerry does on the platform and rewards him and also allows Jerry to build a business on top of Real Vision and earn tokens. So maybe you then affiliate your entire business, say, we're going to move to the Real Vision platform where they're going to give us this amount of functionality. I'm going to charge people in private messaging rooms. And with that, I can build an economy. That is network effect. That's Metcalf's law in, in, in action. I, I'm telling you, I, you might not be the first through the door, but I hope for, you know, I hope you're not the last because I am, what you started doing when, okay. So with Real Vision, you've got Real Vision daily briefing. You give that away free every day. You've got, Real Vision Crypto, you give that away free every day. And then you have multiple layers in the subscription model, as well as most stuff eventually ends up on YouTube either a couple of months or a year or two after it was done. So you've got this monster free resource that is just there. 
monetizing that in a way with these tokens, if there was a way for people to, if there was some like checkout ticket you could get, like I watched Raul's the Bitcoin life raft ticket, and that could get turned into Real Vision for 0.25 of a Real Vision token. And maybe eventually I could earn enough to help supplement a subscription or something like that. That to me is just, it, it's incredible. But I don't want to take too much more of your time because I think I've already gone past, I have. I'm looking at the clock. Do you have time for one short little segment I want to do? Thank you, Jerry, always. You're the best. Okay, dramatic pause. Welcome, folks, to Real Vision Finance 101, where we get to ask an expert a question I have with me today, CEO Raul Powell. So, Raul, here's my question. Explain how inflation is good and desired by the Treasury Department as a means to repay its existing debt burden. I've always, I didn't, I, I don't know how that works. Why is inflation good when it comes to repaying debt? So if you have $1,000 in debt and inflation rises, that debt is worth less in terms of a basket of goods and services. Okay. So if that debt doesn't change in price in the end, because a certain amount gets paid back, let's assume your wages have risen in line with inflation, that debt is now less. So many people, your parents be included, if they bought a house when they were young, the, the inflation of the 70s and early 80s eroded the value of their mortgages. So they had these ridiculously small mortgages. And the so house you're... had gone up a lot in value. So the value of the assets had gone up, but the debt had remained the same. So the debt burden goes down. So the value of the dollar that I have to repay the loan with gets cheaper and cheaper over time? Correct. Correct. But the loan amount stays the same. So that is the incentive for governments and central banks and things of that nature to have inflation. So what is the flip side? Why do they fear deflation? Because every year that prices fall, it's harder to service the debt because the value of the debt goes up in real terms. So if you've got a very indebted society and you have a big deflationary period, then you've got a huge problem because your debt burden keeps going up every day. So thank you for that answer. Folks, tune in to the next Let's Ask an Expert only right here on the Real Vision Exchange. Until next time, ciao. And okay, great. So that uh, thank you. Good, very solid answer. I don't have any more questions. I don't want to press you for time. But if you, if there was something that you, you know, like, if you had a final thought or something you'd like to riff on, no, I'm gonna ask I would love you to something. capture. I'm going to ask you something. Ooh, okay. So, Jerry, you've spent a lot of time researching all sorts of things in the space. You've made mistakes. You've had some great victories, but you've done a lot of learning. What right now is the most interesting thing to you? Where you find your mind going, you know, I'm thinking more and more about that or you know, I'm moving my portfolio around because I want to be more involved in this. What is the thing that's capturing your imagination and why? I'm very enticed by my capital creating a yield that I can live on so that I don't have to ever touch my capital. And that to me is really fascinating for two parts. One, it would allow me the opportunity to actually pass wealth to, to my children. Um, my mother did not have wealth passed to her. My mother did not pass wealth to me. And I have the opportunity to do that. So that is probably like personally, that is probably the biggest thing that I'm constantly trying and to figure out the best way to do that. So. It's, look, it's a minefield trying to figure out all of the different yields. What do you think your 
blended rate of interest is, considering you've got a whole basket of different things that you've tried. What do you think the yield is? Is it 10%? No, 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 it's five. I've already done, I've, I already have a, a strategy in play. So I'm currently at, I'm on net average 5%. I mean, there are a few outliers that I'm getting some pretty high, you know what I mean? But they're, it's a blended rate of 5%. And that and seems is that, to be do you, realistic. Do you think of yourself as relatively conservative, middle range, quite risk-taking? No, uh, conservative. Well, I, maybe I'm, I am taking risk. I'm taking platform risk because I'm on like Nexo and Celsius and things of that nature. So there is, and I'm well aware of these risks, but the 5% with the amounts that I'm talking about, if I'm, you know, stay with my plan and allow them to compound, when I do decide to start pulling the yield into my actuals, like sweeping it into cash flows for my own personal use, um, 5% is fine. Yeah, because in the same, in the other parallel universe, which is the traditional financial system, you'd have got. Exactly. Zero. And I would have, you know what, to get what I'm getting in crypto, and I feel relatively safe getting it in crypto, I wouldn't even get that much going, and I'd have to go to Ford. I'd have to go to the triple C, you know, corporate junk bond market. And I think what are the, that whole market is topped out at what, 4.5% or something? And the difference is, unlike a bond, you're getting price appreciation as well. So the value of your portfolio is going up. Don't tell anybody. And the yield. <laughs> oh, it's, it's staggering. Now, you, you'll have to go through a bear cycle, but it doesn't matter because you should be getting yield. Your yield may change a bit. We don't know. We're going to find out. It'll be the grand experiment. And your portfolio will be cut in half. And well, you've already just gone through that in the last <laughs> three months, as we all have. So we kind of doesn't scare us any longer because we just lived through it. But if your yield maintains, then you don't care. Exactly. Exactly. All the things. Now, remember, and in you, fact, you, you compound, about this. Right. You compound at lower prices. Exactly. Now, if you, you know, it's it for those like you, you've talked about this. You're not, in, you personally aren't interested in yield. But one of the things that that is so interesting in the yield category for me isn't dollar amounts. It's the fact that, like for instance, I run my math out. My four Bitcoin in five years will actually be slightly over five Bitcoin. I know Raul's interested in having four Bitcoin turn into five Bitcoin without any further influx of Raul capital. Have you even considered dabbling, like have some portion sitting in a Nexo or a Celsius or an Abra or a BlockFi or something? We are all, we are, we're all weird, right? We're all humans. So right. my weirdness is I've taken this very big bet, as you know, that I've been very public on. And most people say that's incredibly risky. But I'll take that risk, but I won't take the risk of the, of the yield platforms because oh. my risk is defined, which is I want to make capital growth out of this bet. That's the bet I'm taking. This happened to me in the past with MF Global. You might not remember, there was a futures brokerage company called MF Global that, that, um, um, that went under. So I had made good money in 2012 by betting on the European crisis. And then the futures exchange went bust. And I lost my money. And so I suddenly realized I had a risk that I didn't, I, I mean, like you, I was kind of aware of it, but I, even then I didn't get it out in a bet at 90%, but it took eight years to get back. Um, so I'm actually more risk averse in some things than I am in others because I know the risk of price and I'm comfortable with it. I don't know the risk of other things like a, a DeFi protocol getting hacked or whatever it is. Not to say it's bad. It's just, we're all comfortable with certain risks that we take. Right. Yeah. It's, it's risk analysis, right? Just, just as a, as a category in this space is difficult because there's so many, okay. Nexo is different than Celsius than Abra. And then you've got that whole world of the, the DEXs with the Uniswaps and the one inches and all those things. I, I don't touch any of those things. I just don't have any idea 
how to even gauge my risk with it, at least with like a Nexo and a Celsius. These are these are actual companies. These are actual uh, regulated in jurisdictions that have some semblance of uh, law and governance and, you know, insurance to some degree and have a track record over the last X years, what, two year plus of at least meeting you doing what they say they're going to do. That's really at the end of the day, what I care about. And, um, and I don't have all of anything in one thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. That whole, not your keys, not your crypto. I'd say probably for me, 50% of my holdings are in wallets that I own the private keys to, but they happen to be wallets on protocols that allow staking. So there is a yield mechanism built in the protocol, just like a little, it's like a little cash machine. Yeah, staking is actually quite different. And you know, this whole Ethereum staking thing is going to, I think it's going to shock a few people because it becomes very easy to, to own Ethereum, to stake it away for a year and still get the upside appreciation and not have to do anything. So you've got yield and price and security because you're not on a platform. Exactly. I mean, there, you know, that's what well, that sounds like to me, risk free yield. And, and if you're going to get that at 10% or whatever, 5% or 3%, whatever. well, like polka dots, 12%, the Cardano is 5.3%. Um, I took a long bet on Ethereum and put a few Ethereum into their 2.0 contract, which will not expire until actual 2.0 actually happens, which nobody really knows when that will be. So it's kind of an indefinite play, but I was willing to do it um, to kind of help this, hopefully help the community and, and secure a spot. But then there are the plots. So there's, I have my stuff mixed all over, you know, between the Nexos and the Celsius and the Abras and the BlockFi's and the Cardano wallet does its thing and the Polkadot does its thing and the Avalanche and all these different things have their own little, you know, all the ones that do generate their own staking rewards. I will stake with them before I stake to a, a platform or a exchange. Yeah. Because I own the keys, right? This That's whole right. bearer instrument thing is new to me. And I think a lot of it's new to a lot of my generation who hasn't been in finance. And you and I are the same age, roughly. I was born in 65. I think you're right 68. there. 68. Okay, yeah. you're just a just a baby. He's got so much road ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, that's that whole bearer instrument thing is a relatively new concept for me. And I think a lot of folks in our generation, it's just we never until you get into real estate, and even that, if it's mortgaged, you don't own the title. So we've never really expressed what true ownership is, true. And this world opens that up in a way where you can get in and have ownership with, with a dollar. Right. It's fine. It's fantastic. So I want to close out with one last question. It's going to be a real quick, actually, yes or no. If I put together a white paper on a video game type format to deliver financial literacy principles fun for children, would you be interested in reviewing it for me? I would, but I'm not the best person for it because I maybe you could help me connect it to somebody. Yeah, it would yeah. be great. And go on to the exchange and post the idea because somebody in our community is going to be a game developer and somebody's going to be an educator. And I don't even have kids. So when you're talking about game developing education for kids, I'm not the guy. But somebody in the community, using that community word again, will be an expert. And he'll say, sure, Jerry, I can help. And then all I have to say is, will you take RV tokens for payment? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Raul. It is such a joy every time I get to converse with you and interact with you on whatever platform we're on. Thank you so much for your time. Tell your wife I said hello and give your best to your mom for me. I will do. And uh, take care, my friend. And thanks Pura vida, again. mi amigo. Ciao.